good there and welcome back. So today it's going to be our first section, our first introduction to Go routines. And the way you create a Go routine is the Go using the Go keyword. And so we're going to be looking at a Go statement. Now, you can create Go routines um, from methods. Um, we haven't really talked about methods yet, but methods are functions on objects. And we're not going to spend too much time um, looking at that today because we haven't really worked with methods and objects yet um, in terms of creating our own. Um, and of course, they won't work with functions. And we've been using functions and function literals. Uh, function literals, you will see, are just uh, basically anonymous functions. Now, I have um, linked to the section in the specification that talk about Go statements, so definitely check that out. I also have some other resources here for you. So um, the specification, there's a tour of Go, and it covers um, you know, an e effective Go. And it talks about concurrency and how Go routines and channel fit into that um, whole model of concurrency model. And of course, um, there's some reading material you can find in this Golang book. And I definitely advise you to watch um, these two videos on concurrency, why concurrency is not parallelism, and then advanced patterns in, concur in Go concurrency. Uh, we're gonna touch on some of those patterns, but um, definitely watch the, these two videos. All right, so what I'm gonna do is start off by revisiting an example we did in chapter six, seven, and in section four, where we had a channel, we created a channel, and we'll look at the code in a minute. We created a channel, we had a producer, a function called producer, that produced some values into that channel. Then it closed the channel, and then it returned, um, the function returned, of course, after it's finished. And then we were able to invoke the consumer, which would then consume those values from the channel and you know read them out and did whatever it had to do. So we can assume that the producer is producing some values into a channel, consumer do some um, computation. And so this is sort of meant to illustrate um, time. Okay, so you might not spend a lot of time producing the numbers, but you might spend a lot more time consuming those set of numbers. And so this is time along this axis here. Now, this is all done in serial. What we had before was done in serial. And so I'm still doing things in serial, but now I'm saying, well, producing numbers, assuming that oh, the production of one number doesn't really depend on any other number, I can break that up. So I can say produce one number, produce a second number, and so these boxes are two, tells me at all, this is my producer, okay? And so my producer could produce one number or run for a little bit, do something, run for a little bit more, do something else. And so it produced five numbers into a channel. And then I could run my consumer just as before. And my computer consumer would spend some time consuming one number followed by the next. And of course, consuming all five numbers in this example. Yeah, but it still takes the same amount of time. Um, nothing is being done in parallel here. So... Um, the only thing I'm saying is that the work to produce a number here, uh, every time I click it, change the screen. Every time I, the work done to produce a number here is um, the same, um, it's independent of the work done to produce this number. Okay, that's all I'm saying is that these pieces of work are all independent. Now, one of the things I can imagine is that if, since um, producing the number is independent, one number to the other, well, the only thing I need is once I produce a number, I can consume it. So really, I could produce a number, switch it over to my consumer and say, hey, go consume this number. Then go back to my producer and say, produce another number and switch back to the consumer. So if we just look for a sliver of time, no, these are still ser serial. I, my consumer still has to wait until I produce a number before it can consume it. But for a sliver of time, I can say the production of a number and the consumption of a number, A and B, is sort of having a concurrency, concurrently, right? Um, just for a similar time, I could say these two things are happening together, but it still takes the exact same amount of time. So how might we get, we write our example that we had before that was previously like this, where we just spent time producing numbers and then spent time consuming it, to something like this, where we sort of bungs between the two. Um, and of course, being that all they're independent, we should be able to say, We'll produce a value on a channel, have my consumer consume it, and then, of course, I'm playing. Now, it mightn't be exactly like this. I might be able to produce two values before my consumer gets to consume one. So I'm just making an idealized um, simplification here. 
so let's go to the code and so let me save this and minimize this for now and so here I'm looking at that example I told you about in chapter 7 and section 3 and there's the example where we create a channel 10 integer we call a, a producer and it produces three numbers on that channel and then it closed the channel then of course then my consumer got to run and it read out the values from the channels and print it out so what we're going to do is we're going to start off our example here by with that code so i have a directory here for chapter 8 section 1 and what i'm going to do is i'm going to copy the code from 703 main i'm going to copy that into here main okay and so now let me quit this editor and open the one I want so I'm gonna go up into 01 here and then say code and so now in chapter 8 section 1 we're really starting with the same exact code but of course this is introduction to um, go statement right introducing go statement all right and so we start now with the same example and let's just run it and see it runs go run main and this is what we get right right into channel reading from channel but right now i don't want to focus on whether this is a read only channel or write only channel so i'm going to take that out what i really want to focus on the fact is that i want to do things in such a way that i don't have to wait on each other and the reason why i have to wait until i finish producing if I could go consume, it's because of the fact that I only had one go routine, which is running my main, and it executed this function first, then this, then this. Now, if I put the go keyword in front of this, and then I put the go, well, I'm going to not put the go keyword here. What I'm going to actually do now is actually have something where here I've created another go routine, which is going to spin up and have the numbers be produced here on this channel and the main go routine after the main go routine launches this this is its own go routine so you could think of this as go routine 2 is going to be running producing values and my main go routine is going to come back and it's going to be running this consume and so while it's sitting in consume consume is ready to read a value from the channel and it may not be a channel because this go routine may not start up yet to read from it but that's okay because I have two go routines running, uh, my program is not going to say, oh, um, I'm blocked or deadlocked. Because it knows that, you know what, the other go routine that's running here will eventually produce a value, right? So there's another go routine. So let's check that out. And here I'm going to instead, um, let's do this. Um, you know what, I'm going to instead do a for loop for i gets zero i less than 10 i plus plus and then i'm going to produce values on my channel of i times 2 for example and then i'll probably sleep in between producing values and i could sleep wherever i could sleep before i produce a value or after i produce it so i'm going to say time i'm going to say um do this time that after and I'm going to say 200 mil times 200 times milliseconds, right? Okay. So basically, I'm going to call time that after to produce a channel. And then after that channel, I'm going to essentially try to read the time. So it's going to be blocked here. Oh, actually, I don't even have to do this. I can say, uh, why am I doing this? I can say time that sleep for two milliseconds. Yep, I don't even need to do it that way. I'm going to just do time that sleep for 2 milliseconds. Okay, 200 milliseconds. So I'm going to come with 200 milliseconds. And what's going to happen is this is going to start up, get blocked here. This go routine is going to be blocked, but that's okay. I have another go routine, the main one running this consumer. It's going to come try to read from this channel. Nothing is going to be in the channel. And then it's going to wait there. 
until this guy pushes over value, then it's going to consume it and print it out. And one of the things I can do is I can actually say, put this in here. Um, let's do this. I'm going to put in here. Um, what did I do? This. I'm going to say in here, write into channel. Okay. And then put here, oh, when it's read from a channel, it writes it out. So that's okay. Okay. And let's run this. And I'm going to say, go run again. And notice you can see what's happening now. Right into channel zero. And then, of course, once it wrote, wrote that value, I was able to read it out. In this case, it looked exactly like in my idealized case where I wrote a value, consume it, wrote a value, consume it, right? Um, so, but it doesn't have to be that way. It wouldn't always be that way. So let's do that. And then once I close my channel, well, you know, there wasn't anything else, right? Um, if I take out this sleep time here, um, maybe you might see something different where I might produce multiple values and then read from it. Um, it all depends on how fast and how fast is these go routines I get in schedule, which we're going to look at in a future video. Now, one of the things I want to show you is now I can change how many values I produce on my channel and I don't even have to worry, my consumer doesn't have to worry about it because it's in its own goal routine and it's just simply wait and notice what happens here. Just like I was saying before, um, I can write a number of values into the channel and because I have a buffer of 10, my producer might be able to write 10 values into that channel. When it gets an opportunity, then it can't write anymore and then the consumer consume a value and then of course they have to wait until um, well here my producer gets to write some value into that channel then it's blocked and my consumer gets to read some number of value and they toggle between but it doesn't matter as you can see they work just fine um, I don't have to schedule it I don't have to worry about which one works when and which one gets to run um, go takes care of that formula we're gonna talk a little bit more about how, how that's get done I remember when we had on buffer channel, how that was a problem. Well, look at this. I can have a channel now that's unbuffered and it's simply gonna be that I write one value, read a value, write a value, read a value, right? And no problem, um, the other one thing. Now the reason why this might look like I was able to write two values and then read two values is um, because of the order in which it gets printed on the screen. But, um, I can, I can assure you that we don't have any buffer here as soon as I write, only when I write consent a value that I could read another value, okay? And so it doesn't matter how, what my buffering is now because I have multiple go routine, it works just, just fine, okay? Uh, so I could make that 50, whatever, or no buffering. Uh, when we tried to do this before, when we then had go routine, or no buffer, um, on buffer channel, our code did not run and we had deadlock. Now, that's a lot for one video on introduction of running in Go um, subroutines, right? All I did was really put the Go keyword in front of my producer and basically I went from, I put a loop, I introduced a loop. But that's only because I only had three values. But you, you don't have to do that. The important thing is to just put the Go keyword in front of a function and that's your Go routine. Now, one of the things, remember I talk about function literal? Well, all that meant was this. Remember I could create a function as var, uh, let's call it consumer, uh, well, producer, it doesn't matter. Producer is equals to function and essentially that's the function literal here, right? So I'm taking an anonymous function and I'm storing it into a variable. Well, if I'm doing that, then I can certainly just take that and go stick it right here, right? I can say that I have a go run this anonymous function that takes a channel and then there's a channel that I'm calling it with at the end. Notice I simply copied all of this and stick it in place of where I had that producer keyword, okay? And now I have a function literal that works the exact same way is going to add a function, right? Works the exact same way. This is going to become a little bit um, 
more important when we go into the next section but let's just take this slowly and don't worry too much about it um, just to back up a little bit um, if that's too much for you to consume in one video just let's keep it at this and instead of going to, into a loop let's just do this let's just say write some values and so maybe two five one nine zero okay and that works the exact same I don't know why it's showing oh it didn't update for whatever reason so I think this I but it runs just fine all right all right so I'm gonna close this off here there's an introduction to Go statement, and we're going to see a little bit more about how Go routines work and what is running. On, when I said it was getting scheduled, where one gets to run, the other one doesn't get to run, we'll see what that means in some future video. All right, take care. See you in the next video. Try this out. Post if you have questions. All right, bye.